I'm Dr. Max Gomez. From understanding the truth about stem cells and how they affect our health, to healing plants, healing our skin, and simple ways to de-stress your life, Science and You starts now. I'm Dr. Max Gomez. Stem cells, what are they? Where do they come from? And can they really cure diseases? Ahead on Science and You. I'm Tina Beth Pina. Have you ever wondered how your skin heals itself after a nasty cut? Well, we did, and we'll show you just how. That's coming up on Science and You. I'm Donna Hanover. More than four and a half billion people around the world use plants as part of their health care. You might be surprised at which medicines you buy in a drugstore or use in a hospital actually started out on a farm or in a jungle. That's ahead on Science and You. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. We know that men and women don't always see eye to eye, but what about our actual vision? Is that different too? More on that ahead on Science and You. I'm Magali Laguerre-Wilkinson. Health experts consider obesity to be the most serious medical problem afflicting the U.S. today. What's even more alarming is the increasing rate of obesity among children. What to do? The answer coming up on Science and You. I'm Mike Gilliam. Stress is something a lot of people are dealing with these days. But how do you recognize when it's becoming a problem? And then, how do you deal with it? We're going to find out in just a minute on Science and You. Hi, I'm Erna Bell DeMillo. So life can be distracting from smartphones to, well, just city living. So how do we calm our brains? Well, it could be as easy as a stroll through the park. I'll have that story coming up on Science and You. I'm Dr. Max Gomez. Today we're on the brink of a whole new way of treating diseases harnessing the potential locked inside our very own cells to repair, treat, and even cure some of the most difficult diseases of mankind. We're talking about stem cells. You've probably heard of them, but it seems that many people don't understand what stem cells actually are. Stem cells are early stage cells that can divide and develop into various specialized cell types in the body. They can also self-renew to produce more stem cells. In mammals, including humans, it was thought that stem cells could only be found in embryos, and that's where the controversy over stem cells originated. Well, embryonic stem cells are the cells that are obtained from, you know, aborted fetuses or even products of in vitro fertilization, which are not being utilized. And that's why religious groups and many individuals object to research using embryonic stem cells, and why President George W. Bush banned federal funding for nearly all embryonic stem cell research in 2001. Stepping aside from that, which we all recognize is an extremely controversial and ethically difficult issue, the question comes, well, if we could get the same type of cell from our adult bodies, all the ethical issues get sidestepped. Then in the mid-2000s, scientists in fact found other sources of what are now collectively known as adult stem cells. These adult stem cells are found in children as well as adults. They can be found in many tissues and organs, including brain, bone marrow, blood, blood vessels, muscle, skin, teeth, heart, gut, liver, and fat, among others. They act as a natural repair system for the body, replenishing and healing adult tissue, and now scientists are learning to put them to work in ways unimagined even a few years ago. Stem cells give the opportunity to have real repair of the underlying cause of disease and be a solution of regenerative medicine. So people are very excited about this paradigm shift in medicine, using the cells of our own body to treat damaged tissue maybe even create vaccines against cancer to grow new cell types, new organs. This means that adult stem cells could be used for what's called cell-based therapies, offering the possibility of a renewable source of replacement cells and tissues to treat disease, including Alzheimer's disease, spinal cord injury, stroke, burns, heart disease, diabetes, arthritis, and more. And it's not someday in the distant future medicine, 
There are more than 4,600 clinical trials going on right now using adult stem cells to treat diseases. The most important trials that have been done are, you know, acute heart injury, myocardial infarctions, or what we know as heart attacks, in which patients are getting these cells to help them recover from uh, the damage that was caused by in a heart attack, by having lock of blood vessels. Here's one such success story. I picked up my one-year-old, walked about eight feet, thought I ran like a 26-mile marathon, drove myself to the hospital, walked in, said I'm having a heart attack. Actually, Michael Carlott's condition was in some ways even worse than he had feared. The former football player was also diabetic, and he had suffered numerous silent heart attacks that had so damaged his heart, a transplant became his only option. You know, you're probably not going to, you know, just fifth, there's 5,000 people on the list, and I'm probably number 4,900. And I just said, uh, you know, I just don't want to die right now. I have too much, to, you know, I have kids, I have a wife, I can't, you know, I can't die now. I'm too young. Not only did Michael survive, he's thriving. Michael is even back in the gym these days. How did all this happen? Michael says it's because he got injections of his own adult stem cells. Those cells were extracted from his bone marrow during bypass surgery and injected directly into his heart muscle, where it appears they help repair the damage caused by previous heart attacks, damage that even bypasses couldn't help. I can do whatever I want to do. I can play ball if I feel like it. And uh, it's just, you know, I never thought being where I was, let's say, two years ago, to now, just it's just ridiculous. Going from having uh, walking eight steps to going, let's say, a mile and a half on a treadmill, you feel like Superman. Finally, think about what this all means. In the future, your doctor might prescribe not a pill, but a custom-made batch of cells made from your own cells to treat your disease. It's all about unlocking and harnessing the power of nature to do what it does best, heal what ails you. I'm Dr. Max Gomez for Science and You. I'm Tina Beth Pina. Believe it or not, our skin is a very complex organ that is constantly renewing itself. And when your skin gets cut, your body springs into action. The skin is our largest organ, so it's exposed to all the elements. When the skin is affected, you know, if you cut your skin and you're bleeding, it's a very complex process of healing. You'd be very surprised. Mm -hmm. What's even more surprising is that this complex process is comprised of a multi-stage system of regeneration, which begins immediately following a skin injury. When your skin is cut, the first thing that happens is there are cells in the skin called platelets and they cause a plug and that's what stops the bleeding. Then there is an inflammatory process that goes on and there's inflammation and there are cells that come out of your bloodstream and they're called neutrophils and they're white blood cells and they come and they're the first line of defense so you don't get an infection. And the proliferation step is the step where you're building collagen. And then the fourth step is remodeling. And interestingly, the remodeling process can take up to two years. So you don't realize when you cut yourself, it's a long process for healing where your skin has to get as strong as it once was. But it won't ever get as strong as it was. It will only get to 80%. So any scar you have is only 80% as strong as the rest of your uninjured skin. And sometimes the healing process that forms a scar can go awry. People that have more pigment in their skin are more prone to getting what we call hypertrophic scars, which are thicker scars and keloid scars. But before you even have a scar, there's always that pesky scab, which wound care nurse Ed Moriarty says you shouldn't pick, since not all wounds need something called debridement. And that debriding process cleans the wound and then hopefully takes it out of the inflammation stage and starts to push it, put it into the more proliferation stage. Not all wounds heal equally. There are many factors that come into play when it comes to healing. Sometimes when people are older, they slow, you know, they're gonna heal slower, and then maybe you re-injure the area. What misconceptions are out there about the skin and how it heals? The biggest misconception is people that, you know, have a wound and at a certain point in time decide they're gonna leave it open to air, and, they're gonna, and the scab's gonna form, and then that's good healing which is totally the reverse. It's totally, that's not true. Because we want wounds to heal by moist wound healing. That's the most important. 
You can keep your wounds moist with something as simple as Vaseline, but it's just as important to remember to keep those wounds covered and clean. A lot of people when they're taking care of wounds, you know, years ago would use hydrogen peroxide to take care of a wound and now we know that it's, you need rubbing alcohol to take care of a wound. You don't want to use hydrogen peroxide because hydrogen peroxide has been found to be toxic to the wound and it slows wound healing. For Science and You, I'm Tina Beth Pina. I'm Donna Hanover. You may think that the medicines you use are all created in a chemistry lab, but a European willow tree produces the active ingredient in aspirin. The Pacific U is the source of the cancer-fighting drug Taxol. Many of the medicines that we've used over the centuries right up to this minute come from plants. At the New York Botanical Garden, scientists even created a spectacular exhibit displaying more than 500 species of medical plants. Dr. Michael Balick, the garden's vice president for botanical science, has spent much of his career researching healing plants from around the world. We're standing in front of one of the most beautiful plants in the conservatory, the foxglove. Scientists call this digitalis purpurea. And in the 1700s, a doctor in Shropshire, England, Dr. William Withering, learned from traditional healers that this plant extract could treat uh, congestive heart failure. They called it dropsy at the time. Hundreds of thousands of people around the world are using digoxin and digitoxin to regulate and ensure the proper pumping of their heart. And that comes from foxglove. That is extracted today from plantations of foxglove in Europe, in the United States, and elsewhere. Plants are extremely important today for all sorts of conditions, ranging from primary health care to more serious problems. For example, um, in the 1950s, if, if a, a child got leukemia, there was a 5% remission rate or survival rate. Today with the use of vincristine and vinblastine that are exclusively harvested from the rosy periwinkle. The survival rate is 95%. That's quite a difference, and it comes right from nature. This beautiful yellow flower is something that many of us have in our gardens. It's called calendula officinalis, or the pot marigold. Now, the flowers are very good for healing wounds. Lavender not only has a wonderful fragrance, but this, the oils in lavender are antiseptic. They, they kill organisms, bacteria, virus, fungus. This is the milk thistle. Uh, it's common in the Mediterranean. And the milk thistle has a compound in it called silymarin, and it protects the liver. So, for example, in Europe, if you accidentally eat a poisonous mushroom and are on the road to doom and demise, you'll get an intravenous uh, fluid. Uh, of silymarin, hepatoprotective it's called, and actually can turn a usually fatal poisoning around. Uh, we don't use it much in this country, uh, however there are clinical trials to uh, investigate its efficacy. Milk thistle extract is also sold in capsular form in health food stores, and some people who go out for a night of drinking and excess take a few capsules beforehand in order to protect their liver from the damaging uh, powers of alcohol. Dr. Balick is particularly proud that a former colleague has just recently gotten FDA approval for the use of a sap found in the Amazon as the basis for a medicine to help reduce diarrhea in HIV AIDS patients. He says plants are a remarkably significant part of medicine today. Well, if you were to walk into your pharmacy and look behind the shelf, and ask for something. One in four of those medicines come from plants. Really? Have their origins in nature and come from plants. As Dr. Balick says, the plants used in folk remedies are sometimes inadequate or even harmful, but many times they are the basis for much needed pain relief and treatment. And it's nice to know that scientists are hard at work seeking ways that Mother Nature's botanical contributions can improve modern medicine. I'm Donna Hanover for Science and You. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. We know that men and women don't always look at life the same way, but what about our actual vision? Do we see things differently too? Some eye-opening scientific research suggests that may be the case.
Shimmering green leaves on a warm afternoon, bright yellow flowers, the colors of the world around us. But do men and women see them the same way? We can think about a color space, you know, a color wheel, you know, starting from violet and going around the circle. Um, the circles for men and women are not quite the same. Psychology professor Izzy Abramoff of Brooklyn College has been studying vision for about 50 years. He explains what that difference in our color circles means. Something that a female would see as green, uh, a male might see it as green with a little bit of blue. Now once we go beyond that, when we get into the green yellows, something that a female sees as a green yellow, you'd expect the male to see it as a slightly greenish thing, but he might confuse them. His ability to discriminate those hues from green through to green yellow, uh, not as good as female. Is this why, you know, couples can never agree on paint? Uh, that well might be one of the reasons. <laughs> but in the battle of the sexes, we all have our strengths. While men may be less able to discriminate some color hues, they seem to see other things more clearly. We find that men are much more sensitive to uh, finer details than women, and even coarse details, they are slightly more sensitive. And it doesn't much matter uh, how rapidly the thing is moving or flickering. Men will detect it better than women. So why did these differences in vision emerge? One possibility, but only a possibility, is the hunter-gatherer theory. The idea is that men were the hunters and women were the gatherers, and this would apply once they began to develop in the open savannas of Africa, where you could see things from a long way away. The men were designed, apparently, to detect fine differences far away. Either it's a predator, or it's something important, or it's something interesting. The females focused on what was directly in front of them. They were gathering root crops and so on to eat. That's one possible explanation. Professor Abramoff says the real importance of all this lies in what the research tells us about how men and women are wired. What both studies show, though, and their real importance, is that the stuff that comes out of the retina in the eye has to be reorganized and recombined when it reaches the visual area of the brain. The fact that they are different says that that wiring diagram is not the same. And that's a very important statement. So gentlemen, the next time your wife grimaces at your greenish tie, you can remind her that color may well be in the eye of the beholder. Then switch to red. I'm Carol Ann Riddell for Science and You. I'm Magali Laguerre-Wilkinson. Did you know that over 60 illnesses, from heart attack and strokes, to certain cancers and diabetes, are linked to obesity? Even losing a small amount of weight through diet and physical activity can significantly lower your risks. For perhaps the first time ever, more focus is on eating healthier, exercising more, and losing weight, especially among children. Much of the attention can be credited to First Lady Michelle Obama's anti-obesity campaign. But the medical community is also paying attention. Dr. Louis Aroni, the director of the Comprehensive Weight Loss Program at New York Presbyterian Cornell Medical Center, is an internist specializing in obesity. If this were an infection, we would have resources mobilized like you would not believe. But because it's a problem that has to do with body weight, what people seem to do is to blame people who have the problem. When I graduated from medical school, obesity was not even considered a medical problem. We now understand that there's a problem with communication between the fat cell and the brain. The brain can't tell how much fat is stored and is resistant to this hormone called leptin. So that's what's causing the obesity epidemic. Dr. Aroni can't wave a magic wand to cure this epidemic. But under the right circumstances, he would even support gastric bypass surgery if all else failed. However, he does feel there's a healthier and safer solution. Lifestyle change is the foundation of treatment. So you need to change what you're doing in order to succeed. There is no question. At a larger level, at the government level, why don't we subsidize fruits and vegetables? Why are we subsidizing foods that cause obesity in the middle of an obesity epidemic? Dr. Aroni continues his crusade. The appearance of adult type or type 2 diabetes in children 
we think is a very grave sign, really worrisome sign that something terrible is going on in the metabolism of children. We really need to make a massive effort and it's got to start very early in childhood because the evidence is that once obesity starts, it picks up steam. Are there things that you see if you walk down the street that you could say, if I'd eliminated this, this, this and that, I would already find a cure to the problem? Well, everything from having sodas and juices sold in school vending machines to uh, other very simple methods that could make it more difficult for people to get at calories. What's the advice for weight loss? Eat your vegetables first. That's my advice. So what I'm saying is that w when we look at trying to cut down on food intake, uh, I think that there are some nuances to this. There are some ways that you can do it that make it easier than just trying to eat less food. Eating protein for breakfast that seems to help you to eat less later in the day. So we look at simple ways like that that would tend to sort of be natural appetite suppressants that, that I think help to keep people's appetite in control. While we live in a society where weight loss is wished upon through any means, the truth is there's no fairy godmother. It's just simply about commitment. As for the children, something as simple as eliminating juices and sodas from schools is a significant step in stopping this epidemic. I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson for Science and You. I'm Mike Gilliam. You hear the phrase all the time, I'm stressed out. So tell me, people, what's stressing you out? Maybe we can fix it. I guess what stresses me out the most are uh, economic factors, both personal and on a global scale and a national scale. Okay, what stresses me out the most is when people lie and they backstab because it always happens. It just grinds my gears. People on the street not paying attention to what's going on around, around them and getting in my way. My work takes up 90% of my time and then I have 10% left around my friends, family, myself, sleep and food shopping and laundry and all that. So what is stress? Stress is basically the physical and psychological response of our body to changing conditions, be it real or perceived. Different things stress us out, but one thing is certain. At this point in time, stress is on the rise. In fact, according to the American Stress Institute, at least 10% of the population reports suffering from stress. Dr. Nicole Eldon is a psychologist at the Wellness Center in the CUNY Graduate Center. She says stress isn't always bad. Stress is, um, it can be positive and it can be negative, right? When it starts to venture into the negative realm, when it starts to disrupt uh, the functioning of the individual in their lives, then it can become more of an anxiety and sometimes a depression. But there is also, stress can be positive. There could be a part of stress that enables us to function better in our lives. For example, it gives us um, higher endurance to do things, more motivation to do things, and it helps us achieve. So stress can be positive and negative. Anxiety often is disruptive. Graduate student Aisha Rahim says she feels stressed. I feel anxious a lot. I feel like um, I don't have time for myself. I don't have time to just think or just be in a moment. I'm just always busy thinking about the next thing I have to do. I just never have time to relax. I never feel rested. So you're stressed? Yes. But there are many other symptoms of stress. You would have disturbances in your sleep. You would have disturbances in your appetite. You would more than likely have issues with regards to concentrating and paying attention to the tasks that you are doing. Different somatic issues going on in your body, and it depends on you what that might be. It could be headaches, backaches. Um, you might have muscle tension. You might have a feeling of chronic worry and anxiety, ruminating about something over and over. Other symptoms include rapid heartbeat and trouble breathing, moodiness, irritability, or sleeping too much. And Dr. Eldon warns the symptoms could be different for everyone. But no one has to live a stressed out life. Bottom line, I'm stressed out, what should I do? Figure out what's causing the stress in your environment and internally. Uh, figure out the coping strategies you've used and use them again. If it's not working, use them more than you have in the past. If those are not working, look around you for support systems and see whether others have different ideas. 
And if that doesn't work, seek out a mental health professional who can sit down with you and help you figure out the best way to, to balance your, uh, your system so that the stress gets reduced. So if you're feeling stressed out, take a deep breath and then figure out a strategy for dealing with it. I'm Mike Gilliam for Science and You. Hi, I'm Ernabelle DeMillo. We've heard about the benefits of walking, and we've also heard about the benefits of green spaces. Now scientists are saying that the combination of both can help with something known as brain fatigue. The noise, the multitasking. City living can be quite stressful to the brain. That stress can lead to what scientists call brain fatigue, making us distracted or forgetful. Oh, where did I put those keys? You know exactly what I'm talking about. Now scientists in Scotland have found that a simple walk in the park can ease brain fatigue. The study, published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, found that the brain waves of volunteers who walk through green spaces were much more meditative and mentally quieter. Meanwhile, the brain waves of volunteers who walk through heavily traffic streets were more aroused agitated and frustrated. The scientists say this is a pilot study and more work needs to be done. But expert walkers we talk to say they aren't surprised with the initial results. Uh, when I walk, I seem to solve the problems of the world in my head. I just look at the trees and my mind wanders and it really does make you calm, it makes you happy. I can't tell you how good I feel when I, after I've done, come home from walking. Dodell Shields takes her walking seriously. She's a member of the New York Walkers Club, headed by Lon Wilson, a walking coach and a veteran of more than 100 race walking marathons. Instead of focusing on where we're going, we focus on how we're getting there. So, it's, it's, we try to play it as a science, and when it's a science, the brain is working. Like the Scottish scientist, Wilson emphasizes that walking through the park, especially when one is race walking, doesn't mean we aren't paying attention. Our brains are very much still engaged, Wilson says. It starts with your first step and your first deep breath. Now you're breathing and you're re almost reaping the oxygen off the leaves. You're taking all of the beautiful atmosphere. You're noticing what's going on around you. That's one thing we didn't notice when we were runners. Everything was more of a blur, and then you picked it up, and it was even more blurrier. But you can just, the ambiance and the endorphins start kicking in. So you, you clear your head. And it's best to unplug 100%. I never walk with um, music. I don't like to be distracted. I just like the act of walking itself and enjoying whatever natural sounds there are. But some of us, well, we just can't turn it all off. When you're walking, do you have any of your smart devices around you? Do you answer your cell phone? Do you look at your text? Or you try not to do that? I'm in real estate, so <laughs> I'm kind of plugged in 24-7. Well, at least Gary is outdoors in Central Park answering those calls. So next time you need to take a mind break, just walk to Little Green Space. I did, and I feel a whole lot clearer. I'm Ernabel DeMillo for Science and You. That's our show for today. I'm Dr. Max Gomez. See you next time on Science and You.